Singing da na na, oh da na na na. She's got diamonds on the soles of her shoes. Singing da na na, oh da na na na. She's got diamonds on the soles of her shoes. By singing that song by Ladysmith Black Mombaza, some people are going to say that I was appropriating South African culture. But all jokes aside, cultural appropriation does happen. It happens much rarer than we think, or we're led to believe, of course. But I wanted to take this prom scandal to really explore what cultural appropriation is as defined by my understanding of sociologists. And then we can explore an actual case of cultural appropriation, a gray area, which is the Ladysmith Black Mombazo Paul Simon case, and then this prom thing. So guys, I apologize for my weird handwriting. For some reason, I started curving upwards. <laughs> but this is what cultural appropriation is from my understanding of sociology literature. So to have cultural appropriation, you need two things. One is an unequal relationship between the two cultures or however many cultures that are exchanging value slash cultural stuff. So for example, a colonizer and a colonized or maybe a majority group and a minority group. Something that shows the power dynamics are not exactly equal. So that's the first thing you have to have to fulfill this criteria of cultural appropriation. The second thing you have to have is the weaker culture, the culture that belongs to the less dominant group is being distorted, not given credit, basically bastardized. So I will bring to you an example from 1970 and show what I would consider a legit case of cultural appropriation. Either 1969 or 1970, this was the Solomon Islands, which is in the Pacific. And at the time, the Solomon Islands were still under the jurisdiction of Australia. So UNESCO, which is this World Heritage Organization, they were going around documenting the local hymns, the local lullabies of the people living in the Solomon Islands. And they documented this one lady, I believe her name was Afunaka, and she sang a lullaby to a child that was dead or something. It was a really somber, sad song. <laughs> So somehow, this lullaby made it into a song in the 90s, like kind of like a techno type of song. The tragedy of all of it was the lady wasn't given credit. Instead, they called it a pygmy lullaby. For those of you familiar with Africa, pygmy are a population of people in Africa. So somehow, a Solomon Island, Pacific Islander, Oceania song got distorted, misattributed, made it into an album, and was called pygmy music. If we look at this case, was there an unequal relationship between the two cultures? Yes, because the local tribes compared to Australia or compared to the West, and you know, there's obviously a different power dynamic. Was there a distortion of the weaker culture? Hell yeah. I mean, they even misattributed it to a different quote unquote weaker culture. This is a case that you could argue from sociology, this was definitely cultural appropriation. It was a colonizer or some kind of more dominant culture taking, distorting, not giving credit, bastardizing, um, beautiful, pure, you know, native culture. The saga didn't end there because in 2005, when YouTube came about, remember one of the most famous original viral videos? It was this guy named Matt dancing and being like, where am I? And you know what was the backing music? to his video. It was the 90s version that used, appropriated the original Solomon Islands recording. So now this woman who was recorded singing, never saw any royalties from the 90s, 
and then of course never saw the royalties of the 2005 viral video to the YouTuber's credit. He found out where the actual song came from and he actually went to the Solomon Islands to try to find the lady to thank her or maybe even give her some money or something. And I believe he found out that she died in 1998. I doubt she even heard her song in that 90s pop version. Sadly, she definitely didn't see her song make it into a viral video. And we're not even done yet. Then, this Solomon Island song became like smooth jazz weirdness. So it's almost become like a joke in itself. It's become so appropriate, it's become so bastardized, the original person, besides people like me who studied this, nobody knows who actually sang it, nobody gives her credit, gives her tribe credit, gives her culture credit. This is a funny, sad, but a case that's worth it to learn from and learn how cultures can potentially interact better, mutually respect each other, etc. So now let's go to our gray area example. This is the Graceland album. You know, Simon and Garfunkel, they broke up and Paul Simon in the 80s was like, okay, I need to, I need to have a good single career. You know, I need to go solo. I'm awesome. So Paul Simon goes to South Africa, which at the time was under horrible apartheid. You know, there was a minority group of white boars that were oppressing the majority blacks. And there was a cultural embargo on South Africa. It's like, we're not going to buy your culture, we're not, there was a trade embargo, we're not gonna trade with you, blah, blah, blah. Paul Simon's like, no, but there's music to be celebrated, there's artists that need to make it onto the world stage. So Paul Simon went and found Lady Smith Black Mombazo, and Lady Smith Black Mombazo has a really cool type of harmonic style music that's called Izikatamia. <laughs> It has a lot of cultural components of living under apartheid and everything. So it's a very beautiful and culturally rich type of music from South Africa. So Paul Simon takes the group Lady Smith Black Mambazo and basically sings with them, makes a whole album with them. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. As if everybody here would know exactly what I was talking about. I'm talking about diamonds on the soles of the shoes. And the album went on to sell millions. It was really popular. It angered a lot of people who were like, yo, Paul Simon, we're trying to defeat the apartheid government. And Paul Simon's like, no, I'm giving credit where it's due to black musicians, to the South Africans. The cultural appropriation gray area in this case is that it's like, oh, it took a white dude to go into Africa and he's, he's now uh, showing the rest of the white world black music. Oh my God, right? So. Is there an unequal relationship? Well, at the time, yes, there was between the West and Africa, you know, but the West was economically, militarily, etc., way more powerful than South Africa or the rest of the African continent. Was it a distortion of the weaker culture? Now, that's a harder point to argue because it wasn't like the previous case where he's like, oh, I made this music, or he's like, oh, um, this is Egyptian music, right? Everyone knew he was bringing South African Isikatamia into his singing. Was there a distortion? Was there a bastardization? I would argue no. I actually saw Lady Smith Black Bombazo in 2008 when I was at University of Pennsylvania. They came to perform and the way they're singing is still the same way that they sang in the album that Paul Simon did. So it wasn't like they did anything different. It wasn't like they changed themselves to be in Paul Simon's album. So Paul Simon really took the genuine original Izakatamiya and just made music, part, part Western music to it. So that's why it's a gray area. There is an unequal cultural slash dominant weak relationship between the two cultures being exchanged, but it's not like the weak culture got distorted or got bastardized or, you know, even got made fun of. So now let's go to this controversy. Like, the scale at which we were talking about, you know, one's cultural appropriation over decades, another's under apartheid, and now we're talking about this. Like, what the fuck? But, okay. She's a girl from Utah, and granted, Utah has, like, no Asians or any diversity. So in 2016, according to my research, 
Asians made up 1% of the population of Utah. So Asians are a very minority population. So this girl, she wears a prom dress. That's like historical era in China represented in the way she's dressed. So this Asian American was like, oh, stop appropriating my culture. And it generated a Twitter shitstorm, etc. It's like a huge shark fest going on right now. Let's take this paradigm of unequal relationship and distortion of weaker culture. Now, Asian Americans, yes, we are a group, a minority group in America. Now, was she distorting the culture of China, you know, whatever historical era? Was she making it look bad? Was she misappropriating it? Um, I don't think so. I think she was celebrating it. She seemed like a girl who liked it. I mean, she's wearing it to prom, so she must like that dress. So I don't think the second condition really fits. She's definitely not bastardizing or distorting unless you, you literally think that a white person in like a Chinese dress like is bastard like they just like as in it looks aesthetically bad. I mean you maybe you could argue that's <laughs> is there this unequal relationship, this unequal cultural exchange? And that's the thing I'll pose to you guys actually. What is there? Because on one hand Asian Americans are a minority group, especially in Utah, they're only 1% of the population. But on the other hand, if you really wanted to argue, you'd be like, she's not appropriating Asian American culture, she's appropriating Chinese culture. Now, is there a unequal relationship between China and America anymore? But how does this compare to the first two examples I showed you? I want to thank the like three or four people asked me to talk about this topic. So I'm honestly more interested in some of the previous examples I gave because I studied that in college. But you know what? Since this happened, this happened. I know I didn't give a definitive answer. I want to look at all sides of this. I have my own biases, but I'm trying to understand why someone would be really, really offended by this. So, guys, leave comments, man. Or talk on the Discord, whatever you guys want. Talk to you guys soon.